this kind of sparked a lot of intrigue because that seems like an absurdly elevated number. Like these are elite athletes. What's the probability that somebody who has breathing issues is going to become an elite athlete in an endurance sport and that the majority of the players on the team are, you know, all have this legitimate issue. So guys, Derek, moreplatesmoreaids.com. Today we're going to be talking about doping in football. This was an interesting thread that came up on the subreddit that I thought was worthwhile to uh, touch on. I've touched on it briefly in the past, um, but I thought a dedicated video to um, actual pulmonary capabilities um, and some of the mediums utilized to kind of leverage, I don't know, like doping modalities and endurance sports would be worthwhile to get into above and beyond the standard, you know, blood transfusions, hematological fuckery that goes on. This is about asthma diagnoses and actually getting uh, prescribed drugs to enhance, you know, lung capabilities essentially in non-asthmatic elite soccer players or football players, whatever you prefer <laughs> to call it. 63% of Liverpool FC players have asthma. Video idea for Derek. By contrast, 9% of the population have asthma on average because they allegedly have asthma. They can take a normally banned drug called salbutamol. So if you guys don't know, salbutamol is the chemical name for albuterol. So if you've ever heard of clenbuterol before, this is a beta 2. Receptor agonist that is used in bodybuilding quite often as a fat burning agent as well as something that can induce mTOR phosphorylation and is useful at low dosages for females for actual hypertrophy without the androgenicity that comes from anabolic androgenic steroids. Um, and it has some performance enhancing effects above and beyond its you know ability to increase energy expenditure, but also it's like mainly used as a, like these are drugs designed for asthma applications. So albuterol is similar in this class of medications and is often prescribed as an inhaler, but it also comes in oral formats and injectable. So we're going to be getting into that shortly. Not here to pass judgment, but would be interested to hear Derek's take on this and the performance enhancing benefits this drug could offer to someone with and without asthma. I heard in baseball, way more players have been diagnosed with ADHD for, med for the medication. Greenies were used in baseball openly for decades. <laughs> cough, cough. Yeah, I got asthma too. Let me get that clen doc. Sheesh, as an avid Liverpool fan, I wasn't aware of this. Considering the type of play the coach demands from them, you wouldn't even think they have asthma. To be honest, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you probably wouldn't think it because they probably don't. To be honest, they've probably got some doctor on the books that's pretty liberal with their diagnoses. It is weird. Like, again, when you're getting diagnosed with asthma, like, there's a lot of fuckery that can happen. It's not necessarily. Like there's something called exercise induced asthma too, which is very, very reproducible. And a lot of elite athletes actually could, you know, qualify relatively easily. And they certainly do. To be honest, they probably got some doctor on the books that's pretty liberal with their diagnoses. It is weird that no one talks about PEDs at all in football like they do in other sports. Most football clubs do this. This has been a known secret for years and has been reported in the past, but hasn't gained mainstream traction. Asthma medication increases lung capacity. So anyways, getting into it, this is the, uh, the article that made this initial claim. According to a source close to the club of 35 players, 22 are asthmatic. 63% of the squad, over five times higher than the 12% UK average. To keep the players at the max for an entire season on numerous, numerous fronts, substances to enhance the support performance are needed. So you know, this kind of sparked a lot of intrigue because that seems like an absurdly elevated number. Like these are elite athletes. What's the probability that somebody who has breathing issues is going to become an elite athlete in an endurance sport and that the majority of the players on the team are, you know, all have this legitimate issue. This was an article published a week and a half ago ish. Um, there has been some controversy following reports that an abnormal amount of Liverpool FC players are allegedly asthmatic. Reports state that 22 out of Liverpool's 35 first-team squad suffer from the breathing condition asthma. There have been some suggestions that the club are using asthma as an excuse to provide players with a medicament that could be considered as performance enhancing and therefore that the club are cheating. But what is the truth behind all this? In this article, we take a look at the overall case medicament in question, salbutamol, 
albuterol, and other areas that may lead to an answer behind the case. So do they actually have asthma? Like again, this is not something that has been verified necessarily. However, there has been nothing shown to disprove it either. So this was, you know, like an insider source um, leak apparently. So it's impossible to assert that this is actually the case. This is speculative at the end of the day, but it is, you know, circulating rumor that seems to be verified by some people. Any keen football fan knows that the English Premier League is renowned for its frantic pace, being physically demanding and requiring extreme fitness levels. Therefore, if there is a way of seeking legal performance enhancements, there is bound to be strong demand. Let's see, why do people suspect they're cheating? At first sight, it'd be fair to assume that Liverpool are very unfortunate in having so many asthmatic players. But when you look closer, this may open up a loophole that results in PEDs being used. The main accusation of cheating comes through a medication called salbutamol. It's a medicine it used to treat those who are asthmatic. If we believe the above, it could be expected that the majority of Liverpool squad are taking it. Salbutamol is used for its qualities of relaxing the muscles of the airways into the lungs, helping the person to breathe easier. This can be a big help to anyone who is asthmatic or in the midst of breathing issues. There are also concerns about salbutamol's potential to be used as a doping agent. In 2010, the drug was added to what is prohibited list due to concerns over an increase in physical performance after someone inhales salbutamol. While this was eased slightly in 2011, queries remain over its use. Some have pointed to Liverpool's aggressive pressing style and the abnormally few injuries that the squad have acts as more proof uh, that something isn't right. The enhanced performance associated with salbutamol could explain this. Overall, there's therefore a concern that Liverpool FC are cheating by giving players performance enhancing drugs under the guise of treating their parent patients for asthma. This is what causes some people to suggest Liverpool are cheating. So again, salbutamol is something that is just like Clen, a beta-2 receptor agonist, um, works by causing relaxation of smooth muscle. It's used to treat asthma, asthma attacks, but most notably, Exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. Yeah, this is something that is definitely reproducible in athletes, like I mentioned, and um, can be leveraged, in my opinion, um, and has been, like, historically in track, too. Like, this is something that is really, really fucking common. So this was the study, though, that eased concerns back in, what, where was it? Uh, or this was the study, sorry. Effects of inhaled salbutamol and exercising non-asthmatic athletes. We can circle back to this after, though, because this is actually a case of a doping test revealing high concentrations of salbutamol in a Swiss track and field athlete. Basically, there was this urinary cutoff they've established of 1,000 nanograms per milliliter as their kind of like value to determine whether you were using a prescribed inhaler through a therapy therapeutic use exemption or orally administering the drug because there is a performance enhancing advantage to be had through high enough doses and or using different administration patterns like again drugs behave much differently depending on how they're administered like if you inject Dbol versus orally administer it like just first pass metabolism the way it produces metabolites or breaks itself down interacts with different the body in different ways you know sublingual versus intravenous versus inhalation versus oral versus up your goddamn butthole like there's different <laughs> different administration ways that result in different proportions of metabolites which all have their own inherent individual specific pharmacologic effects at different receptors and this drug is no different but the urinary concentrations are much harder to achieve with inhalation than would uh um, when you see a thousand cut off, essentially, this is kind of like the benchmark where they're like, there's no way this could have been a legitimate prescription with an inhaler. But we'll get into that later and if that's actually legit or not. Because again, we've seen studies as far back as like, I don't know, when they were first assessing anabolic androgenic steroids, they literally had studies that showed it had no performance enhancing effect. Uh, which is fucking insane, dude. So sometimes these limited, like these low sample size studies are not the most ideal way to make a definitive conclusive statement on if something is or is not useful, especially with the limitations of the conditions imposed to and the individuals in question in the study, the limited sample size, blah, blah, blah. Dosage administered, individual dose response. Like there was, um, like even in the uh, trans athlete discussion, like studies showing that testosterone has no bearing on performance whatsoever, even though that's like literally the fucking biological differentiator in males versus females essentially is actual output of testosterone production and downstream to that DHT too. But like that is obviously something that requires a bit more, I don't know, 
exploration before you can definitively just say like, oh, 11 people didn't have blatant performance enhancement at a therapeutic dose with an inhaler. Therefore, a cutoff of 1,000 is adequate, which is much higher than you can achieve with the therapeutic dose of an inhaler. In addition, the inhaler itself at therapeutic doses is not useful for non-asthmatics who have exercise-induced uh, bronchoconstriction. Because again, this is something that is not uncommon in athletes to have this exercise-induced bron bronchoconstriction. Just a quick look at this study for prevalence, pathophysiology, patient impact diagnoses, and management, because um, I did want to touch on what exactly this is again too before we get into the actual effects in non-asthmatic athletes. So this is something that can occur in individuals with and without asthma. So you do not have to have asthma to actually have this occur whatsoever. You could be a totally normal, healthy, non-asthmatic individual, and it is prevalent among athletes of all levels. In patients with asthma, symptoms of EIB significantly increase the proportion for reporting feelings of fearfulness, um, frustration, isolation, depression, embarrassment compared with those without symptoms. Can also prevent patients with asthma from participating in exercise, negatively impact quality of life, um, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, the overarching consensus though that is you know useful to take out of this is that this is something that can happen in elite athletes and is not uncommon despite the fact that they're non-asthmatic. Like this is a, a Mayo Clinic breakdown of exercise-induced asthma Elite athletes, although anyone can have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, it's more common in high-level athletes. About 90% of people with asthma have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. However, the condition can occur in people without asthma too. So very notable. Now, getting into the effects of inhaled salbutamol in exercising non-asthmatic athletes. This was a 2011 study, I believe. Um, let's see. Or no, this is an older one, but this is one of the ones that sort of spit in the face of, you know, obviously this is not going to be useful because of this study on trained, 12 trained triathletes. It was using 200 micrograms, 800 micrograms, and placebo, and seeing how it affects these individuals for endurance time, maximal oxygen uptake, metabolic parameters, psychomotor performance. And what they found in this 12 trained triathletes was neither endurance time nor post-exercise bronchodilation were significantly different between the treatments. Metabolic parameters were affected by exercise but not by treatment. Inhaled salbutamol, even in a high dose, did not have a significant effect on endurance performance in non-asthmatic athletes, although the bronchodilating effect of the drug at the beginning of exercise may have improved respiratory adaptation. Our results do not preclude an ergogenic effect of beta-2 agonists given by other routes or for a longer period. So if you go all the way down and kind of uh, expand on that though. At the end of the exercise period, that is 40 to 50 minutes after salbutamol inhalation. Now keep in mind, like a football game and you're comparing like end of exercise period is 40 minutes after inhalation and you're having these detections, like that's pre pretty significant given like you're not gonna be drug tested in the middle of your game, obviously. So anyways, the pl plasma salbutamol level was extremely low, 0 0.5 to 9.6 nanograms per milliliter with the 800 microgram dose. With the same high dose, salbutamol levels in the four hour post-exercise urine specimen varied from 200 to 700 nanograms per milliliter. And the total amount of salbutamol recovered was less than 100 micrograms. These values are very low. Salbutamol doses given in asthma are usually far lower than 800 micrograms. So they would probably result in a negative urine test should they be inhaled by an athlete during a competition? And positive urine tests probably indicate use of a systemic route and or of extremely high doses. Yet the French anti-doping laboratory considers that urinary concentrations of salbutamol above 1,000 nanograms per milliliter can preclude oral absorption of the drug for purposes other than the treatment or prevention of asthma. In conclusion, our study failed to demonstrate significant enhancement of endurance performance and metabolic or psychostimulant effects of large doses of inhaled salbutamol in highly trained non-asthmatic cyclists, 12 of them. However, Salbutamol had a slight but significant bronchodilator effect, which may be sufficient to improve respiratory ad adaptation at the beginning of exercise. It is unlikely that the widespread use of salbutamol by athletes is driven by the weak effects of inhaled salbutamol. We believe our data suggests that most non-asthmatic salbutamol users take the drug orally or by injection, probably for protracted periods. This pattern of use may be associated with ergogenic and metabolic effects. Policies aimed at restricting the use of performance enhancers should reserve inhaled beta agonists for athletes with documented asthma. So again, notable is the widespread use of salbutamol. This is something that is 
definitely highly used in track, highly used in football, highly used in anything endurance related and is, um, and anything endurance related is going to be looking to leverage things that can enhance oxygen carrying capacity, lung capacity, et cetera. Any pulmonary capabilities that can be maximized, any kind of edge you can get, especially when you are in a state of extreme stress, some of these like, you know, deteriorations of performance metrics will become more apparent like deep into a game or into whatever your sporting event is and could be attenuated or offset to some degree with administration of you know certain compounds that you have therapeutic use exemptions for or otherwise or are otherwise undetectable because of loaded or high detection limits relative to what these use exemptions are or what they can actually find in bioidentical tests. Like for example, with EPO, is your hematology changing slightly over time when you went into a tested sport with a like pre-formulated <laughs> assessment of your hematologic variables but like longitudinally over time before you even entered the sport and you kind of know how to fuck with the system, blood transfusions, EPO administration, et cetera. Like that sort of thing, you already have an edge through an oxygen carrying capacity, red blood cell count aspect, and you get into things like, you know, bronchodilators and whatnot, and you can get into another vector of performance enhancement to leverage, and you get into other metabolic modulators that are, you know, overlooked entirely. Things like, you know, acute dosages of L-carnitine. Like there are so many things that are either not being tested for and are totally compliant, or you can kind of like get around something that's banned by simply following their own guidelines they've laid out that are not sensitive enough to actually detect it adequately. But anyways, it's not like this is something that's going to be ultimately the make or fucking break. Like this is makes an Olympic athlete versus doesn't. And this is like everyone's doing this shit. But there, every little edge you can get at this level is like a big needle mover potentially. And with salbutamol, this is something that I am relatively familiar with its use in terms of hearing the prevalence of it in track, prevalence of it in this sport, um, and other endurance activities. So getting into the pharmacokinetics too, this is something that if you understood how you could <coughs> acutely leverage it, you may be able to get away with an even more aggressive beta-2 adrenergic receptor agonism effect through oral administration or manipulating it maybe with injections or sublingual administration. You've probably heard me talk about sublingual um, administration either for changing the way a drug hits by getting a more acute spike in plasma concentrations or in doping things like the Duchess cocktail where, you know, like the legendary cocktail used by uh, Rod Chankov and the Russian athletes um, who would swish this drug cocktail around their mouth and get um, absorption through the uh, mucosal membrane like directly into the bloodstream almost representative of an IV administration of sorts this is the sort of thing that you could potentially leverage to with salbutamol if you had a preparation design that was conducive to actually getting maximal absorption because again bioavailability is relatively low through oral administration there are different ways to fuck around with this stuff that probably like it's impossible <laughs> for like drug testers to keep up with all this shit and be on point enough to test you at the exact time and window. Now, again, I've done recent videos on drug testing and how to make them bulletproofed. But when it comes to endurance events in particular, this is something that is a lot more problematic than something like a anabolic androgenic steroid that has byproduct effects on other hormones in the body that are essentially impossible to avoid suppression on and or dysregulation of whereas with hematologic variables like you can actually manipulate this stuff just by your environment and whatnot and create like a, hypo a hypoxic state even through like sleep apnea could be representative of a change that would otherwise be achieved through i'm not saying sleep apnea is good by the way i'm saying that there are different ways that can cause a physiologic response of an upregulation of like your hematology profile that make it very hard to fucking tell. Like, it's not like if you have EPO administration, you have like a negative HPTA feedback where all of a sudden, you know, gonadotropins drop. And again, even with anabolic steroids, they're not even testing for gonadotropins longitudinally. So like, this is almost, this is me just going to the bulletproof level to try and like explain all of the mechanics that go around the shit. Because again, even 
the discussion I just had about anabolic steroid detection, WADA is not checking for LH and FSH levels longitudinally, like I said. So even, it's almost slightly taking back what I said, like there are ways to fuck around with that too, given the holes in their testing parameters because the funding is just not there to do maximal bulletproof testing for every single athlete on every single randomized test, unfortunately. So ultimately with stuff like this, you know, when there's therapeutic use exemptions involved, people can qualify as an asthmatic patient with like no fucking effort whatsoever. You just, you know, induce like a, I don't know, bronchoconstriction episode essentially with like a hard training session and then you get diagnosed by your super liberal, flexible as fuck doctor that you have on the, on the club. Like that is some way that uh, a lot of guys are getting salbutamol and they end up with something that could be leveraged for offsetting to some extent this exercise induced um, asthmatic, you know, episodes that people, you know, essentially undergo during extreme endurance events, stress, football games, essentially. So anyways, getting back to the pharmacokinetic profile, we can see the half-life is three to five hours with oral dosing, two to seven hours with inhalation, 5.5 to 6.9 with intravenous. And hypothetically, if you wanted to get really fucking intricate, you could create your own novel Administration practice. So development of fast disintegrating sublingual tablets with enhanced bioavailability and improved clinical efficacy for potential treatment of asthma. So maybe we can get away with a lower dosage burden too that is less detectable, which has a higher spike in plasma concentrations as a result of better absorption, better, you know, like representative of intravenous administration, essentially, if it was absorbed properly through the mucosal membrane. Um, like this is an example of formulated sublingual tablet versus oral. And we have this mean salbutamol sulfate plasma concentration level showing a significant superior outcome for this T7 novel preparation of salbutamol that would be administered sublingually under the tongue like so, absorbed quickly, spikes really aggressively, and gives you a excretion pattern that may otherwise be superior to oral administration. We don't know. I don't actually know for certain that that would be the case. I'm just outlining, you know, different kind of variables to be considerate of too. Because again, their thousand nanogram cutoff is not necessarily like, they have to have some leeway because there are a lot of people with asthma. And in addition to that, like they, they can't prove that these people aren't legitimate asthmatics. So they have to have some like threshold level, just like with testosterone to epitestosterone, they have to give you some leeway that you might be like a genetic outlier or that your excretion patterns are going to be slightly different than the average individual. So this gives people a bit more leeway too, especially when you manipulate your excretion patterns too through different enzymatic inhibition pathways and whatnot. It's pretty fucking hard for them to be super dialed in on the shit, just put it that way. So again, there are different ways to manipulate the administration practice as well as the excretion like what shows up in your urine in how concentrated of a fashion it shows up, um, what metabolites are being created. Um, is it hitting first pass? Is it skipping it? Are you administering it like fucking rectally? Like, what are you doing? There are a lot of, I'm not saying that this works for this necessarily, by the way, but there are like wild things people are doing to achieve different kinds of pharmacologic outcomes with manipulating the way your body metabolizes it and then also leveraging the threshold amounts that WADA has essentially been forced to impose because they can't prove, they can't just like discriminate against like legitimate asthmatics. So we have beta two agonists in their banned substance panel, prohibited at all times in and out of competition. You see salbutamol right there. However, exemptions um, or exceptions, inhaled salbutamol, maximum 1600 micrograms over 24 hours in divided doses, not to exceed 600 micrograms over eight hours starting from any dose. So again, we had the 800 microgram max dose being used in this salbutamol data that we saw. And we saw cutoff limits that were, you know, potentially way fucking lower than what you would otherwise um, potentially be leveraging. Now again, like with this 800, within the, with the same high dose salbutamol levels in the four hour post-exercise urine specimen varied from 200 to 700. So imagine you're the guy with a 200 nanogram per liter liter urine sample using an 800 microgram dose of the inhaler you know, maybe you can get away with a fucking mega dose of the inhaler, or maybe you can get away with, you have different excretion patterns, you can get away with an oral dose maybe. Who knows, bro? But this is something that is being leveraged um, widespread in football, I believe, and it's not necessarily to, uh, I don't know, like, is it even cheating if it is within their limits? Like, this is literally a rule they've imposed and says this is a legitimate thing you can fucking do. Now, again, I guess hypothetically, if you're exceeding these dosages and they say, literally do not use it orally, 
or intravenously or whatever, like the presence in urine of salbutamol in excess of 1000 nanograms per milliliter is consistent with the therapeutic use of the substance and is not consistent with therapeutic use of the substance will be considered an adverse analytical finding. And again, they would then, <laughs> you would have to prove as an athlete through a controlled pharmacokinetic study the abnormal result was a consequence of a therapeutic dose by inhalation up to the maximum dose indicated above so again they have these like very concrete cutoffs and if you're within that like maybe you can still attenuate some of this exercise induced bronchoconstriction that would not be unreasonable and i think is definitely the case but above and beyond that there is some degree of fuckery where you can go to like supra territory as well um, and people definitely do. And couple this with all of the different metabolic modulators in play, you could get a pretty significant edge over a guy who is doing nothing or otherwise thinks that everyone in the league is clean. So that's my take on the situation and uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. All the comments help the algorithm. They're much appreciated. Like, subscribe, um, check out my... Actually, you know what? Let me know what you think about the team itself. Liverpool FC, do you think they are the most prominent cheaters in the league or what do you think you know this is uh it's an interesting topic um a lot of people are uh i don't know i think it's a lot more in the dark what kind of drug use goes on in football and it's a lot more uh i don't know a lot more pride is taken in the fact that everyone's clean or that everyone's clean a lot of people like to think that um i don't think everyone's using shit of course however i do think it is more prominent than people are under the, a lot of people are under the impression so like the average person thinks like the fucking rock is natural, bro. Like that's what, that's what we're dealing with. So anyways, let me know what you guys think. Who is the dirtiest team in the league? I don't know. Any comments? They help the algorithm. They're much appreciated. Like I said, like, subscribe, check out my blog. Moreplatesmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram. I'm moreplatesmoredates. Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below. Um, I haven't done this outro in a while, dude. Damn. Um, Gorilla Mind, nootropic formulas, Gorilla Mode, pre-workout formulas, I designed myself from scratch, recommended diet model for gaining muscle and sports performance, my preventative medicine and hormone replacement therapy platform. Um, this is where you can get diagnostics done as well. Um, lab work, self-service labs. It's very, very comprehensive, turnkey, great shit. This is weird. I haven't done my outro in a while. <laughs> Other stuff that helps support me. It's all down there. I'm either... I either own the company or I'm associated with it and it helps support me when you guys buy their stuff. Um, check it out. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.